particular Singer machine is one of the most famous models that famous Singer makes. The Singer Round Bobbin Economy Model. It comes as both a gorgeous cabinet machine and in a portable style, complete with handsome carrying case. Now, here's that offer. Let's look at some of the exciting new features of this Singer Round Bobbin Economy Model. There's the new bobbin winder that stops automatically when the bobbin is full. The new numbered tension control that makes tension adjustments so much faster and simpler. The new hinged presser foot that goes over heavy materials as easily and smoothly as fine fabrics. And this machine lets you finish off your sewing with a neat back tack stitch. ...file is only $114.95 with a down payment of just $10.95. And with either model, you'll receive the famous Singer Sewing Course absolutely free. Hello there, welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room. Some of you may have noticed in my video last week I pointed out that I had a couple of new sewing machines down here in this room. And the one we'll be using today is of course the 1955 Singer 99K. Now this machine being the black and gold old-fashioned looking Singer does look more like an antique than something that is vintage. But this one was made from 1954 through 1956, or at least the serial number indicates that's the range. So this is a mid-50s machine, even if it does have the look of its predecessors. This model in general, the 99K, was made from 1911 through 1958 and retains its more antique styling, which is really fun to have here aesthetically as well. But of course it does also still work and has that lovely motor on the back and does have a foot pedal. So all those modern 1950s conveniences. Singer did make 99Ks like this one, which were made in their factory in Scotland and made in the UK. That's what the K denotes here is that it was made at that Scotland factory. They also did make US versions of this machine that don't, don't have the K, just the 99. And the 99 series, both of those machines in general, were considered like the 3 4th size of the Singer 66, which is just a little bit longer, a little bit bigger machine. But all the mechanics and everything seems to be the same. This one's just considered the portable one, which I think it's like 20 pounds. So I don't know how exactly portable this huge piece of machinery really is is but that was that was their idea of portable at the time despite being a little bit smaller it does have the same mechanics and everything so it's a very powerful machine can go through lots of denim some people use them for leather and things like that and i was very happy to pick this machine up on craigslist in such good working order some other details of this model 99k include a drop-in top loading bobbin which is a little bit rare for the time this also does have a bobbin winder on it so you can wind your bobbins right here on this machine you just have to switch over a few things and then it also does have a back tack or a reverse um, stitch, which was kind of a newer thing at the time to be able to go in reverse. Of course, this machine does only do a straight stitch, but I only use straight stitch 98% of the time. And when I'm not using a straight stitch, straight stitch, honestly, I'm usually doing a buttonhole, which this machine can do with an attachment. And I did actually manage to pick up one of those attachments, which we won't be using for our dress today, but maybe we'll do a separate project sometime just so I can show you how cool that buttonholer is. But I could kind of go on and on about this machine. I've had so much fun researching it, taking bits of it apart and putting it back together, taking it apart to oil it properly and fixing the tensioner, all that jazz. But uh, maybe I'll sprinkle in some more details of how this little machine came into my life as we go about this video. For now, let's jump on over to the blue patterning table of doom and I'll show you my design so that we can get started. All right, here we are over on the blue patterning table of doom, and here is my little sketch. This dress is basically identical to this one, which is a dress I've had in my wardrobe for several years, made of a sale stretch cotton sateen I picked up at Joanne's one time. I do have a couple yards of this left, actually. I need to make a skirt sometime. But this dress serves me so well in my wardrobe. It's very comfortable with the slight stretch in the sateen, and I can style it up or down, and so I would just like to have another one, honestly. Also, can we all appreciate what it's like to have a nice, sharp haircut, because I've been giving myself haircuts this year and I miss my stylist. And here are some patterns from the mid 50s. This pattern in the center, I do believe, is actually from 1955. Although I will be sewing my darts smoothly as opposed to using them as tucks as this pattern does here, but very similar, simple, sort of almost sloper-ish design. Using your basic block is very easy to make something like this, and I won't even be modifying my basic block skirt at all today. And then of course the pattern on the right here has a very similar neckline, at least for the front of my dress. I do just keep the back a very simple curved neckline for this one, but very similar neckline shape here from the mid 50s. And here we are ready to do some pattern drafting. Of course I have my basic block pattern. These again are just on black poster board, copies of my fitting shell, block, sloper, whatever you want to call it. I use the terms interchangeably, even though they are not exactly all the same thing, but for our purposes, whatever, it works. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw a straight edge here so that I can trace my bodice front. Um, if you're new around here, I do 
custom make all my patterns to fit me based off of uh, bodice blocks drafted from measurements in a standard measurement chart. I have videos here on the channel showing how I do this. Um, they're not exactly the most engaging thing ever because it's a lot of math and geometry and drafting the basic pattern set is irritating, especially because you have to make several mockups, making it fit you perfectly, little adjustments. But once you have one of these basic blocks, you are golden as far as I, um, you know, like to say, because you can draft anything from them and know it will fit. And to be able to do so, I'm going to take a tracing of this front. And I'll just go ahead and connect my darts here. I have marked the dart points and the apex from that pattern onto this tracing because we will be using some slashing and spreading of darts today to create a new all-in-one sleeve version of this pattern. I have shown how to draft the all-in-one sleeve here on the channel before in one of my older videos, but I didn't have this top-down setup yet. And as usual, I was kind of quite rambly and who knows how clear it was. So I will go ahead and just do this modification again here today because I do use this style of bodice so often in the all-in-one sleeve. Um, I even have card copies of this pattern traced because I use it so often, as often as I use my regular block. So to create this all-in-one sleeve up here, to kind of have a grown-on sleeve sometimes it's called, we're going to close this dart that's into the side seam of this bodice here. And to do so, we're going to draw a line from one of the dart legs here to the apex, which is a point you can't really see here, but I promise is between these two darts, the center of the bust apex point there. And then we're going to go ahead and draw a new line for this fullness to go to up here in the armhole. And I'm kind of just centering that in the arm here. It doesn't have to be this exact spot. As you can see, I'm not being extremely precise. That's because it doesn't really matter where I put it up here. Now for the next step, I am going to have to cut this pattern piece out. So I'm going to go ahead and do that with these giant paper shears that do serve as a security, you know, device also. Um, if you dropped these on your toe, you would be a very sad human. But I'm just going to go ahead and cut all of this out so that we can go ahead and slash and spread, swing that side dart closed. All right, now that I have this cut out, I'm going to cut down to the apex from each of those new dart legs here, the red lines I drew. So cut down to the apex, but not all the way through so that we can leave this piece kind of hinged and therefore be able to hinge it closed. All right, here we are. So now that I have that open, I can move that dart wherever I want it. Well, where to where I want it, basically. So I'm going to go ahead and hinge that dart closed by laying this red line that I cut down on top of the other dart leg to go ahead and close that dart away and open it up into the armhole here. I'll just tape that down shut. And then we can go ahead and cut away the excess from this dart here. We don't need this stuff anymore because this dart now is no more. We have moved that fullness elsewhere. As you can see, it is now up here, and we're going to use that extra ease to create our all-in-one sleeve up here. So I'm going to tape on some extra paper, leave myself plenty of room up into the neckline and down onto the side seam so we can draw our sleeve area over this entire zone. But again, just tape all this down so that we can go ahead and draw our sleeve up here. All right, so now I'm going to come two inches down from the bottom of the armhole, the arm side here. Um, you can come down further if you want a more dropped sleeve. You can come up tighter. Um, you might have to do a mock-up to make sure that it's not too tight. But I just like to use two inches as a standard. And then I've just come up one quarter inch from the tip of the shoulder there, just angled that into the neckline and then drawn a straight line out for my shoulder seam. And then I'm going to come out maybe an inch from the side seam here just to give myself a little bit of room for my sleeve and then straight draw a straight line up try and make that as 90 degrees as I can with the shoulder line just because the more 90 degree angles you have here at your sleeve hem as it were the easier it is to just turn it under and hem it instead of have to do anything special up here like a facing or bias tape or anything like that and I've just curved this into the main body here at the side seam with a little curve you can make these sleeves longer you can make them any shape you want really, but I'm just going to do this straight. You can also come and draw a straight line up from the side seam and then just um, have your sleeve not have any extension beyond the pattern here. Just kind of square the whole thing off. That's another version of doing this. And I've been doing that a little bit more recently just because it's so easy to hem that version. Um, you can see me do something like that in the 80s does 40s recreation dress I did recently. I will put a card up to that video here. Here I'm just going over my lines in marker again so that you can see them. Again, always draft your patterns with pencil 
but of course since I'm trying to do a bit of a demonstration for all of you I am using marker so that it shows up here on camera but were I just to be drafting off camera I would be using pencil and that is what I recommend you do as well so you can make any changes and you know be more precise as well because of course a marker pen is not as precise and thin of a line as a pencil pen is but I will go ahead and cut this out now I'll just tape some of this down in the back so it doesn't flap around and get caught on anything and get torn. Do end up using a lot of scotch tape when doing flat pattern drafting. All right, so we have our front here, but now I need to do my neckline, whatever neckline I want to use. You can just kind of draw on whatever you want, especially if you're going to finish with the facing. I try and keep in mind where my shoulder tip is, and I'm going to come out a couple of inches from the closest neck that's on my block and just draw in this sort of shallow, sweetheart curved little neckline that I tend to do. It's kind of like a swoopy boat neck sweetheart combo. Um, I use this neckline a lot. People are always asking me questions about it, but if you just draw it on, you know, it's not anything super complex. I always try and keep in mind where my apex is so I can know how low or high my neckline is. So if you remember the apex is mid bust, you can see that this is quite a high neckline still. You can come down further. You can do whatever you want for a neckline, especially if you're just going to finish with the facing like I'm about to do. All right. So you can take that excess away. And now I will go ahead and trace a facing to use up here. So I'm just going to put a piece of paper on top of this, trace the neckline through that kind of semi-transparent paper. So I'll just try and trace the neckline through here. This is much easier to do when I'm not trying to, you know, do this for camera. But there we are. I'm just going to mark this center front so I know that I need to cut that on the fold later. Then I'll just go over my lines here. Again, I'm sorry I'm using pencil, but you know, I am used to it. I'm not used to using marker to do pattern drafting, that's for sure. And these washable Crayolas, <laughs> the ink from these does go everywhere. And it doesn't stick to the tape, of course, so I just end up with lots of marker all over my hands. I'm going to make this facing two and a half inches wide, so I'm just going, going along here using this clear ruler. You can get these rulers at Joann's or Michael's or most craft stores, I believe. I have had a centimeter one before, too. This is an inch, inches one, an imperial one, but I have had a metric one before because when I studied abroad, I needed the metric version of this. So I had two different ones laying around for a while, which did get confusing. So let's go ahead and cut out this facing here. There we are. I can label that front facing. Again, remember to cut this on a fold and that will finish this neckline edge for me later. So that's my front all in, all in one sleeve, also sometimes called a kimono sleeve, um, especially in like 1950s patterns. However, of course, it has very little to do, no, nothing to do with Japanese kimono, but there you go. So I'll just go ahead and label this and then we can get started on the back. The back is even easier because there are less, because they don't have the bust to deal with in the back, there is one less dart. So we won't be closing a dart to get this shape in the back. We'll just be tracing the shape we created here for the front onto the back. So I'll show you that next. So again, I am tracing a copy of my basic bodice block back drawing in this um, indicator back here for the center back because of course this extends another 5 eighths of an inch for the zipper kind of ease back here along the center back. I always do center back zippers. I do not like sewing side zippers. I don't really like having side zippers on my clothes. I never use them. It is a little bit more accurate uh, technically. I think more patterns and more clothes certainly used a side zipper back in the vintage past, but it is now the future and we can choose at least to have center back zippers if we want them. I'm just going to draw in my dart here as well because of course I will need to use this dart here on the back for shaping the garment but now we need to draw our all-in-one sleeve on here as well. The way I do this is I'm just going to go ahead and take my front pattern and I'm going to line up the side seam here because of course the side seams need to match when you later sew this and I will draw the end of the sleeve. I will just trace this lower part of the sleeve so I know where that needs to be on this. Now you can see the shoulder doesn't match up when you're holding it down there. So now I'm going to match up the shoulder point up here so that I can draw the top line. And I'm just going to actually put little indicator marks. So I'm just going to indicate where that is and then down here where it ends. And I'll just use my straight edge to draw those lines in so they are perfectly straight. I'm not trying to trace far away from me here because this will just be a little bit more accurate. Again, connect that down to the end of the sleeve here. You can see this one's a little bit more angled here on the back, but now it will match up. And I do need to, of course, have my neckline match up as well. So again, I'll mark that, put that shoulder point on top of itself. So I can mark the back neckline here. I'll just curve that into the back and I do end up raising this. I don't know why I came down this like kind of half inch at the center back. I wanted to bring it all the way up. So I 
end up taping on a piece of paper, which you will see in a minute here. Now, because this comes to such a point up here at the, I don't know, shoulder seam, sleeve seam, seam yeah, I'm just going to straighten that off a little bit just because it makes it easier to sew it and hem it later. So I just add this little bit of a curve so this can be more of a right angle up here at the very tip of the shoulder -y zone, all in one sleeve back. Cut two, you know, 2020. I do date my patterns at least with the year. That way I know later when I'm going through my patterns what kind of sloper they I use to make them because sometimes, of course, my body changes over time. And so I end up making a new sloper to fit every few years. And I like to know what year my patterns were drafted because then I can know if it will fit and how it will fit. So you can see I just added that half inch back onto the neckline here, the back neckline. And then again, I will trace a facing to finish the back neck. So just gonna go ahead and trace that through my paper again as best I can. Um, this is easier when I'm not trying to like lean away so that I'm filming clearly. Good to have a facing to finish everything. Of course, you can just line a garment like this, but I am I'm not, I'm kind of known for not lining things, and that's because I don't like buying lining fabric when I could buy more dress fabric. Um, and I'm kind of lazy as well, so there's that. I'd rather just finish things with facings, especially because I'll be using a kind of a medium to thicker weight cotton sateen today, and there's just no need to line it, honestly. Especially when you have a slight stretch in a woven fabric. If you line it with something that doesn't stretch, then you've lost the properties of having that stretch, and it is kind of nice. I don't use knit fabrics, but I don't mind using a cotton sateen with a little bit of stretch in it. In fact, it's quite comfortable, so. All right, so now I can set my block, bodice block pattern away. I don't need that anymore because my new all-in-one sleeve version of it with the fancier neckline is finished here, and I can go ahead and grab my skirt pattern. Again, I'll just be using the basic block skirt pattern for this. It's my pencil skirt pattern. It's the basic skirt pattern that you draft when you draft a sloper or fitting shell. And I also use it for pencil skirts because it's essentially the very, very same. I showed how I drafted this pattern recently here on the channel. So I'll put a card up to that video here as well, but I'll just be using this basic pencil skirt today along with this bodice that we just drafted to make this dress. All right, so here we are, I have my pattern and I have my fabric. I'll be using this fall toned kind of warm paisley today. Again, this is a stretch cotton sateen. This one is from moodfabrics.com. I'm not sponsored by them, but I do, especially this year when online shopping is kind of the only shopping, shop with them quite a lot. So let's go ahead and line up my pattern pieces on this fabric. So I want the stretch to go across the width of my body. So I'm pinning this along the straight grain and right here I'm pinning the center front along the fold here. These are wider fabrics as well, so I can get away with buying less, which I always like. So I think I have two yards of this fabric here to make this dress today. But I will go ahead and just pin this in place and cut it out. And I do need some new fabric shears because it's not like I'm going to go take these to get them sharpened right now. And I've had the same pair of fabric scissors for, I don't know, 10 years now, almost. And I just think I would like to have a second pair on hand. All right, all cut out. Now it's time to, of course, mark my darts on everything. So here is my center front. We can go ahead and start by marking my darts on here. Now, I tend to poke holes in my pattern with an awl so that I can mark my darts through my pattern here. So that's what I've done. I'm just gonna take a colored pencil to do this. This isn't a chalk pencil. This is a Prismacolor colored pencil. Um, that means these lines aren't necessarily super removable, but again, it's the inside of my garment and I don't care. No one will ever see it. Only you and I will know it's there. It's fine. So I just mark my dart points and legs with that colored pencil through my pattern. And then I just trace them with my ruler and thus my dart is marked. I will do this for all of my darts on the skirt and on the bodice pieces. I did do a little research about Singer when I was looking up information about the 99K. And if you've never looked into Singer sewing machine company, like the Wikipedia page for them, um, the guy who sort of started Singer, Isaac Merritt Singer, was an interesting guy. Um, he was born in 1811 in New York and I, his parents like divorced, which was pretty unusual for that time anyway. And he ended up running away and joining a traveling stage act at like age 12. So uh, that's <laughs> already a great start. Um, but he had more of a mind for mechanics, even if he was very interested in being a performer. And he invented some sort of like a uh, digging machine that he was able to sell the patent for. And that helped him get a little bit of money earlier on in his life. And uh, instead of using that to invest in any more of his machinery mind, he started another traveling group, it sounds like, or put it into an 
uh, acting situation, a theater situation, which then, of course, only worked out for so long, and then he was back to having to do some more mechanical engineering. And he was working somewhere where they were repairing sewing machines, and he realized that he could make some improvements to them. Now, this is where he should have been putting his attention, because obviously the whole acting thing wasn't really working out for him. But uh, he made his improvements to a sewing machine. There was some patent disputes and partners, ships created and dissolved, etc., etc. And eventually he started the, uh, the Singer Sewing Machine you know, company, Empire. He received the first patent for his improvements to sewing machines in 1851, and later died with 13 million in the bank in 1875, survived by 20 children from a couple of wives and several mistresses, it sounds like. So he was a very scandalous person. <laughs> but, I mean, completely changed the face of the clothing industry and the sewing industry, which is just wild. I do like to put a pin in the center back of my facings, by the way, just so I know which bit is the back while I'm working early on like this, because these little pieces, it's so easy to get turned around. All right, so here on this Singer 99K, I'm just gonna go ahead and sew a little bit of test stitching onto a spare piece of the sateen to make sure my tension and everything is okay, and just kind of make sure the machine is behaving on this particular day. I do, of course, I'm gonna be trying to keep this machine properly oiled and in working order, even though, uh, you know, it has all of its original bits from the 1950s, which was a while ago, so I will try and be careful with it, but it looks like it's sewing all right. It does have a thread cutter in the back here, a little bit more old fashioned than the modern ones today on the sides of the machines usually, but it seems to be holding well. Stitches look good. You can set the stitch length to like seven stitches per inch down to 30 stitches per inch on this, which is absolutely minuscule and looks quite Victorian. So that's gonna be nice for some possible future projects perhaps, but the stitch length, when it's that small, it's just maddeningly tiny. And I had already wound my bobbin for this, so I'm sorry I won't be showing how this machine winds a bobbin today. Although you did see in that 1950s advertisement how it winds a bobbin from earlier. That is a n advertisement for Singer Machines from 1954 that just happens to, I believe, show this exact machine, which is wild. And I can't believe it cost $1,007 back in the 1950s. Of course, I picked this machine up for $75 on Craigslist. Here I am ready to sew my first dart here. So I'm just gonna start the machine and then stop completely, flick that reverse up so I can reverse back. And then I have to put the reverse back down and find my stitch length again. So it is a bit of a slower process, but kind of makes me take my time. And I was enjoying the process of using this machine. It has a nice sound to it. It has this sort of like, like ticking kind of vintage sounding sound uh, of a machine as opposed to the more modern motors, I suppose. I'm just going along, sewing along that indicator line to sew this front dart. Because these are so large, I do try and curve the end of the dart a little bit and just sew right off the edge, and then I will tie my darts shut, as I always do. So don't tie this too tight, of course. You don't want to pull on the threads at all. You just want to create a knot here down at the end of the point. If you pull on it, you don't want to add any extra tension, you know, it's just going to do strange things to the end of your dart. I'm just going to leave about a one inch tail there, and then I will cut off the threads at the beginning of the dart as well. And of course, that means I need to sew the rest of my darts now, which there are many a dart to sew. Sewing darts and like, I think most of sewing is just sewing darts and pressing, honestly. Um, that Those are two things you have to do a lot of if you're going to make structured mid-century clothes like I am always doing. So practice your darts because you will be doing a lot of them. Give you a little bit more of a different view on this, of this machine. You can see me using the reverse over here and having to set it back. But this machine works like a dream, honestly. I'm very impressed with it. It's working better than my new modern machine is right now. My other new machine here in the sewing room is a um, Bernina Burnett, which is their like diffusion line, 35. And uh, we're not getting along yet. The tension on that one seems much harder to get perfect just because I'm not used to working with a bobbin case. So <laughs> setting perfect bobbin case tension is not something I'm used to doing. And I'm having a great, great time learning, learning how to do that. So this machine, may end up becoming my primary machine until me and that Burnett start to get along. I did place an order for some other presser feet to use on this old Singer machine because the nice thing about these machines is you can easily find replacement parts for them online because there were so many made and um, they lasted so well because they're nice metal machined parts. So I was able to find a button holder attachment for this machine as well as a zipper foot, which unfortunately 
did not arrive in time for this project, which we will get to later. But there are many different feet available for this. You can get a ruffler foot, you can get a binding foot, you can get a zigzag attachment, you can get all kinds of different things to attach to this machine to make it do all those fancy different, different stitches that a lot of modern machines have. But again, most of apparel sewing is a straight stitch anyway. So if you're not sewing with knit fabrics and you want to make clothes, having a straight stitch like this is really all you need. And again, this machine cost me $75. It's in super good working order and I was lucky in that sense because a lot of times refurbished versions of these old singers can be quite costly because the cost of refurbishment, the cost of servicing, not because the machines that um, are costly. Um, a lot of times you can find these for quite inexpensive on say a Craigslist or an eBay or at a thrift store, things like that. And I, I recommend picking them up because you may have a project on your hands. You may have something to fix on them, fix the tensioner, get a new belt for it, um, even a new foot pedal and stuff. But they're such hardy, well-made machines. They're, uh, I guess they've been called over-engineered and they stand the test of time, clearly. The belt on this one seems to be in okay order. It's a little bit, looks a little bit aged, but you can get a replacement belt for something like this for quite cheap online. There are a lot of people who are enthusiasts about vintage singer or vintage sewing machines, and therefore there are many, many resources available on how to service these machines, how to take them apart, how to clean them, oil them, and Etsy shops and online shops that sell replacement parts. So it's not too hard to get going on one of these machines. If you are an absolute beginner, perhaps it might be a little bit of a learning curve, just because if you've never worked on a machine before or something like that, it's going to seem very foreign, of course. But if you are past the beginning stage of sewing, I would say I'd highly recommend these machines. You're going to get a lot of power, not like the same exact amount of power as like say an industrial machine would have, but closer than a modern machine does. And with no little plastic parts to break, it's just going to be a lot hardier. And like any problem that it does arise is much more likely to be uh, something that can be fixed. I'm still sewing all my darts here, by the way. Just sewing lots of darts in the bodice, in the skirt, sewing all those different darts. This does have a light on the back of this machine as well. However, it is an incandescent bulb in there and it gets very hot to the touch. So a lot of people replace them with small LED bulbs, which is something I will need to do once I finally do. I'm gonna buy an extra belt for this just so I have one on hand in case this one breaks. And I think I'll purchase a bulb from the same, um, it seems to be a Singer Featherweight supply shop because a lot of people collect the Singer Featherweight, which is the 221 machine. Of course, this is the 99K, just a little bit different, but the same general idea. Sewing machines usually aren't that different, especially all from the same manufacturer and time period like these Singers. So now that all my darts are sewn, I can come over here and go ahead and press them. You'll see I press curved seams and darts over a tailor's ham whenever I can, but this rest of this could use a little press too. So I'm just gonna give the flat areas of this a little bit of steam and attention so that they will lie a little bit nicer here. And now that all my darts are sewn, I am going to go ahead and take these pieces over to my serger. Now, they did not have sergers in the 1950s, at least not at home. They had the machine, but the home sergers um, or home overlock machines didn't start until the early 1960s, around 1963. But we're going to use mine today because I do have one. And if a gal in 1955 did, I think she would love to finish her raw edges, you know, which is what I'm doing here. I'm just going around the edges of my pieces here that will be exposed inside the garment, because again, not lining this. And so anything that's gonna receive attention from friction, I just wanna go ahead and encase the raw edges in thread here. This is a brother surging machine. I did not pick this one out. I commandeered this machine from my mother ages ago. And the tension on this machine is really off, but it just doesn't matter because I don't need the, stre the stitch to be nice and hold any weight. I only ever use it to bind edges so <laughs> I don't even care if the tension's a little off on this machine. I have worked on industrial surges before and I found that easier to work with than this one, honestly. So I don't really touch this machine other than to re-thread it from black to white. I don't even bother matching the colors closely because of course it's gonna be inside the garment and no one will ever know. And now I can start sewing my pieces together. So here I am with the facing. I am going to be good this time, I promise, and take my pins out as I sew because I don't want to wreck this machine. I'm already too in love with it. Um, unfortunately, the needle plate on this, of course, has no indicator markings for your seam allowance. Someone has scratched in it. The previous owner has scratched a half inch and a five eighths seam allowance, like the indicator line into the needle plate. They've kind of scratched it with like a pin or something. And honestly, uh, thank you, first of all, because now I won't feel bad going over those lines and making them a little bit more clear in the future, I think. So might take a file to that and just mark those in there a little bit stronger because it's really hard to see 
And I'm so used to having an indicator to follow while I'm sewing that sewing with a half inch seam allowance for this project was a little bit difficult. You'll definitely see that when we get to the neckline later. All right, so there's my facing pieces. I can set those aside. Of course, I like to sew everything in batches. So here I have the rest of the bodice ready as well. And I go ahead and sew the shoulder seam here. Again, trying to remember to take out my pins as I sew. Ooh, I wouldn't want all this nice metal machined parts to have to hit a pin. So I'm trying to be good. All right, and again, back tack that. <laughs> it's kind of hard to remember with this back tack because I have to raise the lever. And usually when you are doing a back stitch, you press a lever down. That's what I'm used to on modern machines. So remembering to stop, raise the lever as opposed to lower it and then sew and then shift it all back to be able to keep sewing again, finding my stitch length again. It is, it slows me down, but almost in a good way because I tend to rush. So maybe it's good for me to have a machine where I have to take my time. Sewing the other shoulder seam here. All right. And then I can go ahead and sew my side seams. For this project, I went ahead and just did an additional small line of stitching around the curve. So you can see there's a curve here where this is the end of the sleeve into the side seam. So I'm gonna sew along the curve here once and then I will come back in here once the seam is finished and just add an additional line of stitching in along the little curved area because of course I will be clipping this curve layer later so that it lays flat before I hem these sleeves by just turning them under. So here I am just going under again and sewing an additional line of stitching just for a couple inches along this curve here where I will later be clipping into the seam just so it has a little bit of extra security. There we go. Slice off some extra thread here. All right, and I can do the other side just the same. While I'm here at the machine, I'm just gonna sew the side seams of my skirt here as well. So that's just the next step. And then my skirt and my bodice will both be together and I can sew the skirt to the bodice. Pressing my seams open. Again, the top curve of this skirt, I'm doing over a tailor's hem here. You can get these at most sewing supply shops, quilting shops even might have them. But I think I picked this one up at Denver Fabrics back when that was a store. They no longer exist, but there was a shop here in Colorado called Denver Fabrics and then it was called Colorado Fabrics and then it closed. So it was one of my favorite fabric shops, especially loved their sale table. Anyway, here I am clipping that curve. <laughs> You can see just putting a few clips along the main curved area under the arm and then I'll press that seam open best I can here. Sometimes you will see people then sew the seam allowance down along this little curve here too. Of course if you were to line your garment you would have even less of a worry about it but again I don't line my things. I, I just don't do it. Pressing that shoulder seam open here as well. Again still don't have a clapper so just you know very lightly burning my hands to do this. It's fine. Skin recovers very quickly. <clears throat> and the other side of the side seam, the other side seam, bleh, the same, you know? Sewing can be quite repetitive, especially when I'm like me, I make a lot of very similar projects over and over again. So again, I've made this dress twice before, pretty much this exact dress. And so, and I use this sleeve style all the dang time. I think it's, I really like the way it looks on me and I like how easy it is to sew. So I use it all the time. Here I am just going to press my side seams open on my facing and go ahead and attach that at the neckline here as well. So I have my facing all pinned into place and this is where it becomes a little bit trickier to not have those seam allowance indicators on the needle plate, to not have real ones I suppose, because trying to sew this, remember to take out the pins and keep a half inch seam allowance away from the presser foot all by eye all on my own was an interesting task. All right, so down here, this is where my seam allowance starts to get really tricky because I can hardly tell what I'm doing, but I'm just trying to follow the curve that I had drawn earlier as best I can. I'm just leaving the needle down and turning the entire project to get around that sharp V neck in there. Again, I will have to put a clip in there later. I don't bother edge stitching this particular facing just because I um, know that this fabric will take a pressing and stay pretty well just from experience. Sometimes fabrics don't want to stay in the shape you put them in and sometimes edge stitching is quite essential, but I don't bother doing it today. Of course, I do need to clip the curves of that neckline. So here I am clipping little triangles out of where that curves outwards. Um, clip slashes or like uh, make clips into the where it curves inwards and triangles where it curves outwards. But always clip your curves because 
things are just going to lie so much better, or may not lie at all if you do not. So now that that seam is properly clipped, I can turn it, the facing to the inside here, and give everything a nice steamy press. Just playing with that neckline so it lays all nicely, holding everything into place, making sure it folds inside. I will pin this while it's still warm as well, almost like pinning your hair in place while it's warm so that it holds a curl. I like to pin things while they're still warm so they can cool where I want them. And eventually I will come in here and go ahead and tack this facing down along the side seam here. So just put a couple of stitches in through the facing into the side seam there, or shoulder seam, sorry. And that will help hold the facing inside the garment. I usually will tack the center front of a facing and then the sides. And then of course it's held down along the center back. But here I am just getting the facing to behave. Again, didn't do any edge stitching this time. If I have a very straight neckline or a subtle curve, I'll usually go in there and do edge stitching, but with something like this where I was going to have to follow along the curve real closely and stuff, bleh, I just didn't bother this time. I felt it would behave. Out of experience working with this type of fabric and this style of neckline, I just know I've never had a problem with it before. Now I can go ahead and sew the bodice and skirt together. My skirt pattern does have a little bit extra ease, so that's why you can see it doesn't meet up perfectly at the center back there. It's because my skirt pattern has more seam allowance along the back than my bodice pattern does. It's just something I've never corrected, but it's fine. I don't, it doesn't bother me, you know, but here I am just matching up the bodice and the skirt along the waist, and I can go ahead and sew them together so that we will then have a dress instead of a bodice and skirt. This may just train me to take my pins out as I go all the time, give it enough, you know, time doing it this way. We'll see. Maybe I can be trained. Maybe this old dog can learn a new trick. We'll see. Although I would like to think I'm more of a cat than a dog. I'm not, I'm not actually a dog person. I, I do apologize. I just didn't grow up with them and therefore am intimidated by how rambunctious they are. I'm much more of a cat human where they ignore you most of the time and then act really cute, but don't let you touch them. You know, that's more my, my general vibe. All right, just go ahead and give that little seam a quick press. Some people will put a waist tape in here or a stay in here or sew it twice, blah, blah, blah. I've never had a waist seam come apart on me and therefore I never have bothered. Uh, you know, each of us, as I always say in my sewing videos, to preempt people telling me I'm doing it wrong, each of us sew, must sew in the way which feels best to us. You know, everyone has their own sewing practice, their own quirks, idiosyncrasies when it comes to sewing, and this is just the way I prefer to do things. I've been sewing for over a decade, 15 years, I've been sewing for like over 15 years, and I just do what I feel is best and you know, it's always worked out for me. If I, if something didn't work, I would have changed how I did it by now, but this is a method that I found works for me. And of course, everyone must sew according to how their heart, you know, guides them. All right, anyway, <laughs> I'm just pinning my center back closed here because of course I do my zippers in a strange way for a full, really like, better version of seeing how I do this. You can go ahead over onto my pencil skirt sewing video where I talked about this more, but I'm just seeing how long my zipper is here, putting it double pins where that ends because from that double pin up to the neckline I will sew with a basting length stitch seven stitches per inch on this machine and then from below these double pins down to where I want my slit to be I will sew with a regular small stitch length and sew the back seam shut. So from, from the double pins down to this pink pin I will go ahead and sew with a regular stitch length and then below these pink pins will be a slit and above will be where my zipper goes in. Over on the machine, I'll go ahead and just sew that basting along the top portion of this, helping guide it through the machine here. Although the feed dogs do work just fine on this machine. I'm just helping to keep it straight because this seam allowance guide situation is less perhaps than I'm used to. Over the waist here. And then we have our wider seam allowance down here on the skirt portion just because I have it on my pattern. Plenty of room for a zipper when I do my pencil skirts is the justification there. And now I will go ahead and come off the machine entirely and then come back on with a regular small stitch length so that I can sew the back seam below the zipper. Set that stitch length again with that funny little indicator, the lever, and sew down to where I want my uh, to where I want the slit to begin, basically. There we are, again back stitch, and forward, and off. There we go. 
getting some more now. Nearly done. All right, so I'm going to use that basting that I put in to give this a nice press down the back. Now, so many times on this channel, people tell me, oh, just center the zipper underneath that and sew it and then take the basting out after. That is called a centered or railroaded zipper, and I don't use that style of zipper. People are always telling me I do my zippers wrong because I do a lapped zipper. A lapped zipper and a centered zipper are just two different things, and alas, I prefer a lapped zipper, and this is how I prefer to do them. Again, uh, everyone does their sewing according to how their heart drives them, and my heart says no centered zippers, I like to lap them, and this is how I like to do so. You do you, I do me, don't make me ornery, come on. So here I am just pinning my zipper down to the right hand side of the opening I just created by taking out that basting, um, but now I have this nice crisply ironed edge to pin alongside my zipper teeth here, and I will sew this as close as I can get, especially with this presser foot on this machine, down to the zipper tape. This is the side that will eventually be covered by the lapped zipper, which is overlapped as opposed to meeting perfectly. So I'm just stitching this down to the zipper te tape along the zipper teeth. Zipper tape, zipper teeth. Blech. Too many Z's, too many P's. Now, of course, I, you know, overlapped the other side of the zipper and then tried to get it back on the machine and realized I just can't do this without the zipper foot. I was hoping I could because my zipper foot is still stuck somewhere in Detroit in the mail system. Um, of course, I bought a vintage one online on Etsy, but it's just not here yet. And uh, so to get around sewing the other side of this, again, here we are. Now I'm going to pin that other side overlapping that side I just sewed. Check out my pencil skirt video to see how I do this. So I had to pull out the Bernina to sew the other side of the zipper just so, because I can move the needle on this and get a little bit closer to where I need it to be. But again, not hyper ideal. I should have switched this to at least its zipper foot, but you know, I was just having a frustration with the zipper. Sometimes zipper insertion is seamless and easy and sometimes it's my least favorite step of the process. So I'm just finishing the zipper on the Bernina, but in the future, once that zipper foot gets here through the <laughs> kind of, you know, complex <clears throat> male situation we're having here in the United States right now, um, it could be a little longer than it might usually take. If it ever gets here at all, <laughs> we'll see. Um, but eventually I'll have a zipper foot for the 99K and we'll be able to finish my zippers on that much easier and much nicer. But here I am just finishing off my lap zipper on the newer machine. Boring, unfortunate. So I wasn't able to complete every step of this process on the 99K, but it was a presser foot problem. And alas, a problem that is easily solved. The rest of the steps for this dress, finishing it off, are all actually done by hand. Here I am just pinning the extra seam allowance down along the bottom skirt slip closed, or down, I suppose. And I will go ahead and put some little invisible stitches down here to hold this in place as well. And then I will go ahead, of course, and hem this dress. I also do need to hem the sleeves still, but I do just turn them under just like I'm doing down here by the slit, really. Just turn it in a half inch since the edge is surged. It's no problem to have that edge in there. Here I am turning the hem under a half inch and then an inch up and then pinning that all along. And then I will go ahead and stitch that down. I don't use a, a proper blind hem stitch. I think I just do like a long and short stitch, I think is what my hemming is called. It's just how I've always done it, how it works for me, and again, how I like. I don't know why I'm feeling defensive about my sewing practices today. They work for me. All right, hem all pinned, ready to be sewn up here in the sleeve. That My other last step up here is going to be turning the sleeve hem in again. So I'm just turning that down a half inch all the way along pinning that into place, and then I will go ahead and hem the sleeve by hand as well. This is why I like to have a little bit of room on these sleeves, so that I can go ahead and just turn them into under like this. Um, again, a cleaner, nicer finished would be to use, I don't know, um, round seam binding, bias binding in here, or to go ahead and just line this garment, but I am just going to put long stitches on the inside, tiny little prick stitches on the outside, and sew along like this to hem them you know this isn't couture no one's grading me on my sewing anymore so i just do what works i do the same for the back end of the slit here and then i finish off the folded over the, like very corner of this as nice as i can with some slip stitches just to along that outer edge in here i'm about to come up in there 
and slip stitch. Well, here I'm like kind of felling this down almost. Along here. I use a lot of different hand stitches in the course of finishing a garment, but I don't always know what the name for them is. I'm not thinking about it as I go. I'm just stitching intuitively as opposed to thinking, oh, and here I will use such and such stitch. I'm just like, oh, and here I will sew this shut. Um, so I don't really think about the names of hand stitches when I'm using them. I don't do a lot of hand stitching except here at the very end, of course. There's a weird little fuzzy. Get out. But just slip stitching this little area closed, and then I'll come back up into the hem and go along hemming just as I was before. Long stitches into the fold of the hem and then tiny stitches on the outside. I guess it's a tiny bit different because my stitches are hidden into the fold of the hem. So you'll see that here. Take a tiny bite. Well, I wish you could see that, but apparently my <laughs> filming is not ideal. So I'm going into the fold here. You can kind of see if the camera will behave. Tiny stitch through the outside, up into the fold. Tiny stitch through the outside. Nothing, of course, is seen on the outside, especially in a print this busy. But make sure you don't pull too tightly, I guess, so that your hem stays nice and smooth. Um, that's the other tip for this kind of thing. But I always hem by hand. I never hem by machine. Um, it doesn't take too long, and it's such a nice finish. Here is the finished dressed hand hem all finished, hook and eye sewn in the back, tacked the facing down along the shoulder seam. I always tend to skip filming those last little few steps like that, so if you'd ever like to see me do like a finishing steps or things I always skip filming sort of video for my sewing projects, let me know because there are little things that I always kind of skip, but like I always just figure no one wants to see me tacking my facing down, they want to see the finished project. I mean, I'm rushing at that point, so I assume everyone else is like, let's just see it, you know? I don't know. Let me know if you'd like to see those kind of finishing steps. I really enjoyed using the Singer 99K for this project. I do think I'll be using that machine possibly as my primary machine for apparel sewing from now on, just because I found it so much more enjoyable to use. And I've said here on the channel before that like the actual sewing is not my favorite part of sewing, like as a hobby, um, or in my case, a profession, um, because I really like designing and I like pattern drafting and I like styling things, but like the in-between bit, the actually having to make the thing is not actually my favorite part. I kind of tend to rush and the 99K, like the novelty of it and the, I don't know, I guess the way, this, the way it sounds is so like nice, the aesthetic of it is so nice that it made me enjoy the actual process of sewing the garment more. So I think I'd be more inclined to take my time and maybe do a better job on my projects if I were to use the 99K more in the future. So I'm looking forward to using it. Hopefully I will get that zipper foot in the mail soon so that I can use that with different presser feet and be able to complete the entire project on the 99K. Thank you all as always for watching today and I will see you back here for more sewing and vintage fashion real soon. Bye.